The first thing everyone notices about Blade Runner is how beautiful it is. Along with William Gibson's novel Neuromancer, the film is credited with the creation of the cyberpunk genre, a science fiction subgenre marked by the confluence of high tech and low life. Blade Runner's Los Angeles of 2019 is the archetype of that style, creating it more than describing it, with its giant arcologies, neon lace storefronts, probing lights, and rain. Director Ridley Scott is perhaps the only person who could have adapted this movie from the Philip K. Dick novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, adept as he was at creating atmospherics in the 3,000 TV commercials he directed. In Blade Runner, his trade was fully realized in the service of a simple story loaded with thematic explorations. Most of what you need to know about the plot is explained before the film even starts. Men created smart androids called replicants, some rebelled, cops called Blade Runners were hired to kill them, now the replicants are banned from Earth and given meager four-year lifespans. There was an escape from the off-world colonies two weeks ago. Six replicants, three male, three female. They slaughtered 23 people and jumped a shuttle. In the first act of the film, we learn that four replicants escaped their banishment and came back to Earth, and Rick Deckard, a retired Blaine Runner, is being called back into action to deal with them. In that process, we are confronted with an avalanche of big ideas, what it means to be human, how our memories create who we are, themes of love, exploitation, post-colonialism, social hierarchy, and social decay. And we're given a number of visual symbols as ways into them. For example, eyes feature prominently in the movie. The film opens with an all-seeing eye beholding the world. Deckard and the other Blade Runners use eye scanners to detect empathetic responses and determine who is and isn't a replicant. Roy Batty, in his fight to expand his four-year lifespan, visits the man who designed his eyes. If only you could see what I've seen with your eyes. And the retinas of replicants and other fabricated things are reflective, suggesting that eyes not only see, but reveal and see how Batty finally kills Tyrell, his maker. Much has been noted in other analyses that I'll link to below of Blade Runner's literal representation of social hierarchy, how the upper world is crisp, clean, and predominantly Caucasian, and how the street-level world is dirty, chaotic, and multicultural, paralleling the white flight of the mid-20th century. Much has also been said about the question of whether Rick Deckard is, in fact, a replicant. The film suggests that he is by the use of some strategically placed origami, and also there's this. He's a replicant. But what I really want to focus on is Blade Runner's vision of modernity. It's a vision that finds its expression necessarily in moments between developments of the plot. Take this shot, for example, when Roy Batty speaks with fellow replicant Leon before going into the eye shop. Here is where the relevant action ends, but Ridley Scott will extend this shot for 20 more seconds. Here's what we see. Moments like this are weaved throughout the film, adding atmospheric and emotional context to the main story. Their overall effect, the effect of the film in general, is to produce a world the keynote of which is malaise. See, though it's always cited as a major theme of Blade Runner, I think the question of each character's individual humanity is beyond debate. We would all be willing, I think, to grant the label of human to every main player in the film, replicant or not. The central problem of modernity isn't humanity, it's identity. All the freedom of modern society, all its secularism and egalitarianism and choice, conceals a darker side to the coin, the side in which human identity isn't determined by the society, but by the individual, making its formation, by definition, problematic. The issue of identity is Deckard's central struggle in the film. His inner conflict comes from the gradual breakdown of the only identity he's ever had as a Blade Runner. When Deckard, who has no family or relation to speak of, tells Rachel that she is indeed a replicant, in effect, destroying her identity. Remember when you were six? You and your brother snuck into an empty building through a basement window? You were gonna play doctor? We can see that his self-definition begins to turn on him. He starts to feel her pain as his own, and he begins to loathe who he is. I made a bad joke. You're not a replicant. Go home. 
Okay. He compensates for his self-hatred by drinking. His aggressive sexual encounter with Rachel later in the film is a compensation, a search for a new identity in love, something we can all relate to. He forces her to say, kiss me, because he needs that reciprocation for it to be real. This is not an excuse for assault. It's an exploration of why it happens. Okay, here's my favorite scene of the film, one that is so easy to miss, but which rings so true to modern life that it always makes me cry. After Deckard kills one of the replicants, he goes to a stall to buy some liquor, almost in shock. Take a look. A minute. Yeah, what do you want? Some towel. This enough? Yeah. Liquor may be what he needs to deal with the pain of doing something he feels is wrong, but what he really needs is some kind of connection, some place where the rules of interaction are still solid and knowable. Harrison Ford plays that short scene with such vulnerability, and it's vulnerability I know, and I know the malaise, the ennui, the alienation. I know what Leon means when he says, Nothing is worse than having an itch you can never scratch. Oh, I agree. In the climax of the film, Deckard watches his nemesis, who was himself searching for a new identity, resigned to the one he's been given. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. All those moments will be lost in time. Like tears in rain. For all its poetry, and it is one of the best speeches in film history, no question, it's not really a satisfactory answer to the puzzle of modernity. But Blade Runner doesn't seek to give answers. Modern life is two-sided, and its psychological curses are proportional to its gifts. Blade Runner skews that proportion, turns the dark underside up to 11, to bring into focus the consequences of a society that, for all its members, is as limitless as the vast architecture of a city, yet as indifferent as the rain. <laughs>